You know, you don't think these flying boats are so large, do you, till you stand no. right here alongside of them? Tremendous oh, things, yes. Beautiful things. Yes. Uh, looking through into the floodlit office now, I see Mr. Menzies is, uh, has just been facing another battery of cameras. And uh, I just can't quite make out how long it will be before he'll be uh, broadcasting his speech. Coming now are some very important looking briefcases which are being carried by naval officers. The launch you can hear is the launch going away from the pontoon that brought the Prime Minister to the landing stage. This is also different to welcoming one of the boats into the harbour. The flying boat at the present moment is tied up and everything ready at the mooring buoy out here in Rose Bay. The officers of the flying room here are packed with people, movie cameras. Mr. Menzies is just standing in the centre of the room. We hope any moment now will make his broadcast to the people of Australia. We understand that uh, the acting Prime Minister, Mr. Fadden, will introduce Mr. Menzies to the people of Australia. We're just waiting for a signal as to when the Prime Minister is ready to start. At the present moment, the movie cameras are shooting a picture of the entire cabinet. Well, I think it's the entire cabinet. They're all very well-known faces in there. They're taking the cabinet first, and then I suppose they'll take Mr. and Mrs. Menzies. Even though the day is a horrid day here in Sydney, the streets all around Rose Bay are lined with cars, the hills are lined with people, and flying planes are still flying overhead here. Even the sheds round here, around the bars around Rose Bay, are lined with people looking on. It's a great shame, really, that the day was spoiled by this very, very unsettled weather. Mr. Menzies, even though looks well, looks a little tired, which is only natural, I suppose. And I should think of all his trips in planes that he left here. The last hop over the Tatman was the most pleasant one of all. Prime Minister has just taken his place in the centre of the cabinet. Uh, watch this. Now they're calling for silence now. Ladies and gentlemen, the acting Prime Minister, the Honourable A.W. Fadden, People of Australia, on behalf of the people of Australia, I welcome back our Prime Minister, the Honourable R.G. Menzies. Mr. Menzies has returned today after having travelled 40,000 miles, after having carried out a strenuous and a very valuable mission on behalf of the nation of Australia, and particularly on behalf of our war effort. Strenuous to himself, valuable to Australia. Valuable also to the British Empire. And being valuable to the British Empire, valuable to the cause of democracy. Mr. Menzies left Australia as a national leader. He is returning to Australia as an international figure. We are pleased and proud of what he has accomplished. We are quite satisfied that the people of Australia will recognise the very valuable service that Mr. Menzies has rendered and will welcome him back, fully realising his value to Australia, his value to the war effort. Mr Menzies, your colleagues of the Ministry greet you with enthusiasm. Enthusiasm only exceeded by the joy that Mrs Menzies and your family will greet you back home. You virtually have come back from the battlefront, and we are anxious to cooperate with you we assure you of our continued loyalty, and we assure you that what you have done on our behalf has been appreciated and will be appreciated by the people of Australia. We welcome you home. Yeah, 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 yeah. Acting Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I want first of all to say thank you 
to my colleague, Mr. Fadden, for what he said. And I want to say thank you to my other colleagues for the magnificent way in which they have held the fort during my own absence. I was very struck today on coming back to the landing stage to find myself being reminded of one very interesting fact. And that was that just as I come back from representing Australia in the councils of the Empire in this war, so my friend and colleague, Mr. Hughes, in his day, came back after doing magnificent work on a similar journey. And it gives me the most unfeigned pleasure to feel that the work that he did and the work that I have tried to do myself should be linked together by this personal meeting once more on this occasion. I'm not going to take your time now by endeavouring to say very much about this extraordinary journey. It has been an extraordinary one. It has been full of interest. It has occasionally been full of hazard. It has at all times been full of instruction. And I have endeavoured so to represent Australia as to convey to the centre of the war effort of the British Empire some of the spirit which I know exists in this country. Two great impressions I would like to mention very, very briefly. The first of them was the impression that I got when I visited in Palestine, in Egypt, in Libya, Australian fighting forces, both of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force. That was a great experience. It was a great experience to see Australian troops at Benghazi within two or three days of actual fighting. But what struck me remarkably, every time I saw your sons and your brothers in those fighting areas, was this. The very first question that was put to me by individuals, by groups, was always the same. The question was, how are they at home? Their minds were turning back, even under those circumstances, to the people that they had left behind them. And I had a real thrill out of being regarded, as I was for the time being, as a sort of messenger to them from their own families and their own friends. And the second very vivid impression that I want to mention at this stage is the impression that I have formed of the magnificent people of Great Britain. The magnificent men and the magnificent women of Great Britain. Before I went there, I had read something about the morale of the British people. I had been given some description of the kind of ordeal that they were passing through. I just want to say this to you, <clears throat> that nobody who has not been through these raids can have the faintest idea of the kind of strain to which they submit ordinary men and women whose one ambition is to live peaceably in their homes. This bombing of Great Britain is a dreadful thing. It's a far-reaching thing. It has done, and it's no use blinking the fact, very great material damage. It has not, I'm thankful to say, materially reduced or reduced at all war production. But above all things, it has left, I was going to say, untouched the spirit of the British people. I don't think that's true. I think that what this raiding has done is to touch the spirit of the British people and touch it to a far finer issue than ever before. I believe that the spirit of Great Britain is being tempered and strengthened by all these things that happen. And when I say that, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about great people, people of great power and great authority. I'm talking about simple, plain people who've never had a place in the headlines, 
who are not known to the world as individuals, but those simple, plain people with so little to lose, frequently with so raw a deal from the world over the last 10 or 20 or 30 years, have been the people whose courage under this ordeal has been so magnificent that I shall certainly never forget it. These common people of Great Britain have, I believe, proved themselves the great heroes and indeed the new chivalry of this war. You and I, back here in Australia, and this is perhaps a trite saying, have no clear conception of the fortune that we have to live without real interruption to our ordinary daily lives, to be able to go to bed at night with no thought that that night may be your last. And because we have this great privilege, because we have the supreme honor of fighting side by side with these magnificent people of Great Britain, I want to say to everybody in Australia, let us give up every foolish practice that will prevent us from pulling our full weight in this struggle. I come back to Australia with just one sick feeling in my heart, and that is that I must now come back to my own country and play politics. I think that it's a diabolical thing that anybody should have to come back and play politics, however cleanly, however friendly, at a time like this. There is one task in front of us, and that is that we, the people of Australia, should do as much as the people of Great Britain towards the winning of a war which is our business just as much as it is their business. For myself, I come back here stimulated to an effort which must surpass any effort of my life. And if I can, in the course of the next few weeks, translate what I've seen into terms which will not only be intelligible to the Australian people, but will move the Australian people to a full realization of the dangers of this war, the great, the terrific dangers of this war, and also of our responsibilities in this war, then I shall feel that I've brought back something with me that has justified you in sending me abroad and has justified my colleagues, to whom I am eternally grateful, in their work of carrying on the administration of this country during my absence. Arthur, I thank you very much indeed for what you've said, and I should like to say thank you to all my colleagues who are also my friends, and say to them, we will move forward together on this task, and God helping us, we shall do it well. We've been listening to the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable R.G. Menzies, speaking on his return to Australia from his memorable visit overseas. This is the Australian Federation of Commercial Broadcasting Stations, and we've just heard the uh, welcoming address to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's own speech. We feel now that anything further that would be said from Rose Bay would be utterly superfluous. And so, will all stations on this relay now please resume their own studio programs?